Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. I'm out in Scappoose, Oregon today. Uh, we went to the Joy Creek Nursery to buy a few plants. They are retiring and closing that nursery, so we wanted to duck out here and pick up some plants. And then, as we've been doing for the last several weekends, our whole family is going out on a hike and going foraging. So I thought I would talk for a moment about foraging and permaculture. You can hear the frogs behind me. They're super active this morning. So in permaculture, we think a lot about sustainable food production, but that doesn't in any way mean that we are not accessing wild sources of food and responsibly sourcing wild sources of food. So I thought I would share a little bit about my experience and knowledge and uh, thoughts about foraging. So a few things for foraging. When I take my kids, we all try and wear bright colors and bright patterns, especially when we're foraging in the autumn. Uh, it is deer hunting season, and I make sure my kids wear red and orange and yellow and um, that we are highly visible. I also take a whistle with me. This is an elk horn whistle that my friend Scott got me. It's really loud, and if I get separated from the kids, I can blow it and they can hear me and you know come running. I also make sure that I text a friend or neighbor where we are going for the day in case we get lost. There was a post in a foraging group this week about a woman who got lost in the Gifford Pinchot uh, National, National Forest and had to spend the night there. Uh, we are not in a position to want to be spending the night outdoors, the six of us and our two dogs, so we uh, make sure that we let people know where we're going and that we also really know the route in and out of the area to which we are visiting. We also make sure we take plenty of food and water and we dress appropriately just in case something happens and we do get stuck outdoors longer than we had planned on being. So as we're walking the trailhead here, I've actually uh, buckled Athena to my belt so that I can film and talk at the same time. So one of the things about foraging and how we want to understand it through the lens of permaculture is that permaculture has three ethics, the third of which is fair share. So generally, when we are out foraging, we want to think about the third ethic of permaculture, which is fair share. Now, fair share extends not only to taking what we can responsibly use, but it also extends to thinking about leaving a quotient for wildlife, leaving a quantity for uh, the ecosystem as it exists, but also leaving a quantity for other foragers. So when we're out in wild spaces and we are harvesting food for our household, we need to be aware that we are not the only foragers out there, or we need to operate under the assumption that we are not the only foragers out there. Now, there are a few exceptions to this. The first one is when you're harvesting invasive species. For instance, Himalayan blackberries, which where we are right now are growing in abundance, which you can harvest not only for their fruit, which makes delicious jam or uh, jelly or wine, but also for the canes themselves, which you can harvest appropriately to make cordage. They're really good as a fiber source. I will be sharing that in a future video because summer, late summer, uh, Mid to late summer is really the optimal time to be harvesting them for that purpose. But, um, um, oh, give me a second. There's wildlife up here. Hang on a sec. I'll be right back. So when we're foraging for invasive species, the rule of fair share doesn't apply because our goal is to really try and harvest as much as we can and reduce the pressure that invasive species is putting on the ecosystem. So if you see uh, some quantity of an invasive species that you can use for fiber, for food, for medicinal pur purposes, go for it. Harvest whatever you need, whatever you can utilize. So one exception to this concept of 
following the fair share ethic of permaculture, well, it's not even really an exception. Just another um, facet to think about is that when you're foraging for mushrooms, there is a saying in the mushroom foraging community, which is no pick shaming. And that's because mushrooms are slightly different than other things you might want to forage for. Mushrooms are the fruiting body of the fungus. So the main structure of the organism that uh, subsists for most of the life cycle is the mycelium, either in whatever substrate they're growing, be it the ground or rotten wood, what have you. And the, the mushrooms that you pick are the fruiting body. And when you harvest them, much like picking apples off a tree, when you harvest the mushrooms, you are not going to damage the organism itself. Those fruiting bodies, you should take as many of the mushrooms as you can responsibly use because they are only in a state of maturity that is good for eating for a very short period of time. If you happen upon a patch of chanterelles or some um, chicken of the woods or some cauliflower mushrooms, take what your family unit can use responsibly. Or another way to think of it is harvest what you can use your own self, but also maybe think about taking some for folks that you know that are physically unable to go foraging, but might enjoy some of that wild harvest. So that's another way to think about the ethic of fair share. If you are harvesting a large quantity of chanterelles, can you share them with people in your community who are not able to go foraging for this nutritious, delicious wild delicacy themselves? Again, whatever you can utilize, be cognizant of that third ethic. Be cognizant of the fact that you are not the only person utilizing that resource. I find in permaculture, it's really useful to continue to draw that third ethic of fair share, um, fair use of resources, leaving enough for wildlife, leaving enough for other people. So keep that ethic at the forefront. It tends to, in our culture of, um, you know, uh, toxic individualism and our culture of manifest destiny and our culture of uh, consumerism, it tends to fall to the back. It's not what we've been indoctrinated with since we were little. In fact, for a lot of people, the concept of fair share feels like socialism. It feels really scary or really, um, they get really defensive when you bring it up. But as permaculturists, we really want to keep that in the forefront of our thinking and have it drive and motivate all of our actions. And in this sphere of foraging is a great way we can start to bring the third ethic to the forefront and help hold it there so that it helps shape the way we think and the way we act in all spaces. So when we're out foraging, it's really important that we view this wild resource as a shared resource. But just because we can forage in the wild, that doesn't mean it is the only place that is available to us for foraging. Urban foraging is another possibility. On parkland, on public spaces, there are lots of potentials for foraging. For me, two of the things that I forage in urban spaces tend to be rose hips, if there is a place I know that isn't sprayed, and uh, chestnuts because there are several chestnuts around Portland that have branches that overhang onto sidewalks or into parks or elementary schools and those are public places where you can forage. Now for us when we forage chestnuts I really really want to be conscious of the two chestnut trees in my neighborhood and how one of them is a resource for a number of elderly immigrant uh, couples in our neighborhood and I want to again have that third ethic of permaculture at the forefront when I'm thinking about foraging. So the largest chestnut in our neighborhood I don't actually go and harvest from because I feel that it is a resource that has kind of been claimed or um, is needed by other people in my community long before I moved there and I feel that they have a priority uh, stake in that harvest. 
So I do utilize the other chestnut in our neighborhood that seems to only have competition from squirrels. And don't worry, I am not depriving the squirrels in any way, shape or form. They get the bulk of the harvest. And uh, usually I'm able to pick up just a few chestnuts every day. It's not enough obviously for any kind of uh, staple protein source for our family, but it does make a nice treat. We can have one or two meals that feature chestnuts in the autumn. But my whole point here is that when we're foraging in urban spaces or in wild spaces, we just want to use that as an opportunity, not only to uh, harvest food and fiber and medicine, but also as an opportunity to expand the way that we relate to other people and relate to the ecosystem so that we have that third ethic of fair share um, in our minds, shaping and driving the way that we think and the way that we operate. ethic of permaculture can feel really radical but it really is just such a foundational part of the way that we need to reframe our thinking and the lens through which we need to view all of our choices and all of our interactions fair share what does that mean is that really such a scary notion the idea that there is abundance and opportunity and resources to go around so that no wild space is exploited, no humans are exploited, and no humans are deprived of the things that they need. We don't hoard resources, we don't take more than we can utilize fairly, and we make sure that there is enough for everyone and every space. That is such a radical concept in a capitalist consumerist society like the one I live in here in America, but it's really central to permaculture. It often gets pushed to the side because it's really uncomfortable to think about us having to do with less in any way, shape or form in order to uh, make sure that others have enough. I'm gonna let this plane pass by. We are near a little tiny airfield and there's a lot of little tiny uh, propeller planes that go over, a little biprops. So one thing I notice is I get comments from folks that are not from the United States, where they maybe have a different kind of um, understanding of resources and a different culture. And it's not a foreign concept to hold the needs of the community, the needs of our neighbors, as being as valuable and as important as our own needs. Where there is not a culture of toxic individuality, where there is a prioritization of making sure there is enough for everybody so that everybody can succeed, so that there is abundance for everybody, is not a foreign concept for those folks outside of the United States in many, many places. And I think that it's so foundational to permaculture that we've got to really um, and wrap our arms and our brains around it and really kind of soak it up, even if it feels uncomfortable at first. Sort of like when you start drinking coffee and it doesn't taste great and after a while you get acclimated to the taste and it becomes, you know, at least for me, a cherished morning beverage that I can't do without. The third ethic is sort of the same. Maybe it tastes a little bitter the first time that you are swallowing it and the first time you're ingesting that concept. But the more we think about, the more we ruminate in this idea that we can have abundance for all people. We can have a abundance without exploiting wild spaces, without exploiting our neighbors, that we can make sure that we have enough without depriving other people, that hoarding resources is not in any way um, a help to us or to our community as a whole, the more we start to think in that framework, the more that we drink down that bitter beverage, it starts to become something that warms us from the inside. I drink that mug of black coffee in the morning and um, it goes down and it just warms my core and it helps get me going through the day. The third ethic is no different. Love to talk some more about the third ethic uh, in the future because I think it's just it's as valuable and as uh, important for us to prioritize the concept of fair share and uh, 
you know, equal utilization of resources, equity in the way that we share resources. That is just as important as earth care and people care. And we cannot actually have earth care or people care without that third ethic. So I would love to keep exploring that more and more. Another thing to think about when we're out in the wilderness is foraging for ideas. We can do this anywhere, but I think it's so important when we're looking at permaculture and designing from patterns to details, when we're looking at creating a, a design that mimics really highly functional systems in nature, while we're out in nature foraging for food and fiber and medicine, let's also forage for ideas. That's a resource, a resource that's free and abundant and we can take as much as we want in sketches, in photos, in videos, in um, mental snapshots. We can take as much of that as we want without depriving anybody else. It is an endless resource. So don't forget when you're out in nature, foraging for those kind of material things that you need. Think about foraging for those conceptual things that you need as well, because it can really enrich your permaculture design when you come back home. I hope that you are able to uh, find opportunities to access and prioritize that third ethic of permaculture and see how it shapes the way that you think and interact with the world around you and with other people. When we think about fair share, when we think about making sure there is abundance and plenty for everyone from wildlife to our neighbors to folks we've never met and for ourselves as well, it's really transformative and really um, can make a big shift in the way that we operate. So if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider clicking subscribe. I also have a Patreon down in the description if you are interested in supporting this channel. I'll be back from my permaculture property in Portland, Oregon next time.